Good morning, church. Good morning. Today is going to be a great day in the Lord. We're studying for the first time the book of Luke. And we're going to be going through a series on the book of Luke. And I know the Lord is going to bless us all. Of course, the writer of the book of Luke is Luke himself. And he not only writes the book of Luke, but also the book of Acts. And so the question comes, well, really, who is he? And there are a lot of internal evidences. First of all, most likely, he's a Gentile. Just his name gives him away right here. Secondly, we find that he likely was a convert to Judaism before he became a Christian. The reason we think this is that, as you well know, Luke joins the second missionary journey. And when Paul was getting together his missionary team there in Acts 16, he grabbed Silas, who of course is a Jewish Christian, and then he grabs Timothy, whose father was not a Jew, and Timothy has to be circumcised in order to be on the team because in every city that Paul went, he went to the synagogue first, and you had to be circumcised to be amongst the Jewish people. There's no word said about Luke, so most likely he was already circumcised, even though he was a Gentile, and so we conclude that he was a convert to Judaism. Next, we understand that he is a doctor. From Colossians 4, verse 14, of course, Paul notes that about him. And then, of course, by being with Paul, he becomes an evangelist. And he's got such a great heart. We see in Acts 16, verse 10, he simply writes, we got ready at once to go on the second missionary journey. And then he's also with Paul as he enters Rome. In Acts 28, verse 16, it says, we got to go into Rome. And so right here, he's talking about firsthand experiences in the book of Acts. Now, the question next comes, well, when are the book of Luke and the book of Acts written? Well, most likely during the imprisonment of Paul in Rome in 60 to 62 AD. We surmise that largely because of what's written in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, it records the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. It records, of course, the death of James, the death of the first apostle. But it leaves Paul in prison. And so the question could be, well, maybe he just leaves out the death of Paul. Probably not. Because Paul's own writing in 2 Timothy chapter 4, which is the last book that Paul writes, most likely in the fall of 66 AD, it simply notes, Luke alone is with me. And so you see the heart of Luke. I mean, he is just flat loyal to God and to Paul. And so because, quote, the book of Acts is incomplete, most likely it's written while Paul is in prison. You know, for a long time, I personally was trying to figure out what the order is of the synoptic gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, of course, they cover the general same material and have many of the same passages. And, of course, I think from reading the commentaries, it's pretty simply resolved in that both Matthew and Luke had Mark as a text. Now, as you probably well know, the book of Matthew is written to basically a Jewish audience. The book of Luke is basically written to a Gentile audience. And so we find from one commentator's point of view, the difference is, is that Luke has access to different what they call Q documents that are oral traditions that Matthew did not. Now, the interesting thing, and I've never seen this, is that Luke and Acts have a parallel to them. The book of Luke is basically the journey of Jesus to Jerusalem. The book of Acts is basically the journey of Paul to Rome. And so right here, we see in both cases an appeal that the whole world is to have salvation. Now, some of the other sub-themes in the book of Luke are joy, money, particularly dealing with the poor, that God has a heart for the poor, and finally healing. And, of course, that's not surprising because Luke was a doctor. Now, here's an interesting thing. The Greek word sozo means to heal and to save. So the Greek mind, like our Western mind, associates the two. So when someone becomes a Christian, we have to say they are saved and their life or their marriage was healed. They're a concept that is melded together both in the Greek and in our own minds. Well, let's get into our text in Luke chapter 1. 
The title this morning is The Arrival of an Angel. Luke 1, beginning in verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write down an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. You know, it doesn't show up in our English translations, but in the Greek, the Greek that Luke uses is a very high classical Greek. I mean, this is an educated man that writes this particular book. And, of course, it contrasts when you're looking at the Greek itself to the other books. The most interesting thing that I find right here is who it's addressed to. It says, it is addressed to most excellent Theophilus. Now, some have supposed that Theophilus is a Roman official because of the address most excellent. Others have surmised that he is a non-Christian that Paul just wants to convert or a weak Christian that Paul wants to have his faith made more certain. I don't think any of those. I think it's simply a literary device. The word Theophilus literally translated means Theo, God, Philo, friend. So who is Theophilus? A friend of God. And of course, very interestingly, the book of Acts is also addressed to Theophilus. Why most excellent? Because anybody that's a friend of God has a truly noble heart. And it's this appeal to nobleness that Paul makes to all friends of God to look into the life of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now we're going to divide chapter 4 into four parts. Verses 5 through 25, I've simply entitled, The Herald of Salvation. Verses 26 through 39, the Lord is salvation. Verses 39 through 56, the scope of salvation. And finally, verses 57 through 80, a new day of salvation. Well, let's get into the text again here, and let's look at the herald of salvation, which is going to talk about the birth of John the Baptist. Beginning in verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Well, right here, this passage is extremely important because it allows us to date the timing of the birth of John the Baptist. We know from secular literature, that Herod was commissioned by Mark Antony in the Senate in Rome to serve as the king of Judea in about 40 B.C. However, he doesn't get there until 37 B.C., and he dies in 4 B.C., and so that's how we know that Jesus was born in about 4 B.C. So what is the actual date of these events right here? Most likely about 5 B.C., amen? amen. Now, the interesting thing, immediately... We get focused in on Zechariah and Elizabeth. And the Bible says, even though they were very old and well along in years, they had no children because her womb was barren. Now, in the Bible, when a woman's womb was barren, very often it was a punishment. It was because of sin. But right here, Luke makes it very, very clear this was not the case at all. As a matter of fact, they had an incredible spiritual heritage. He was of the lineage of of the Levites, and she was a direct descendant of Aaron herself. Secondly, they lived upright lives. Wow. So the issue of their barrenness, this tragic situation was not because of sin, just the opposite. It was because God was setting up a miracle. Yeah. And we remember back in the scriptures, other tragic situations. Sarah's barren womb, the Lord moved, and in Genesis 18, then the child of promise, Isaac, is born. We remember in Judges 13, Manoah's wife has a barren womb. And out of this comes Samson, the great judge of Israel. And then, of course, perhaps the most famous in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we find that Hannah is crying there in the tabernacle because her womb was barren. God answers the prayer, 
And of course, that's where the greatest of all the judges, Samuel, is born. Amen? So anytime there's tragedy, so to speak, in your life, and you feel bare, it's just God trying to set up a miracle. Amen, guys? Let's move on right here. Verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Now, I think most of us are aware that there were two types of prayer at this particular time with the Jews. There was morning and there was evening, or we'd call it probably late afternoon. And at this particular time, there are probably 18,000 priests that were attending to all the needs at the temple. And within these 18,000 were a division of 24 priests. And each division served time, and each priest served within that division. Each priest served for two one-week periods during the year. But there was a special opportunity accorded to a priest every now and then. That was that he would be the one selected, either for the morning sacrifice or the evening sacrifice, to enter the temple itself and go into the holy place. And it was done by Lot. Now, once you got picked to do this one time, you never were allowed to try out for it again. And can you imagine being a priest, and the Lot falls to you, and that particular sacrifice, you're the one. Out of 18,000, you're the one that gets to go in. And offer the sacrifice. It would be the greatest day of your life. To enter the holy place. And offer a sacrifice. For all of God's people. That's why there's such a crowd waiting outside. They're waiting for the blessing when he came on out of the temple. Well, let's see what happens right here. Verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will bring, be brought back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Is that awesome? Now we need to understand what happens. The lot falls on Zechariah. He says, Zechariah, you're going in. Now they wouldn't know that they were going in until right before They went. Can you imagine just the exhilaration he's feeling? And so he goes on in with the sacrifice. And there on the left is this candlestick. On the right is the showbread. And right in front of him is the golden altar itself. And then right behind the golden altar is the veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place, or we call the holy of holies, of which the high priest would enter only once a year. Can you imagine going on in? And this was his only glimpse, guys. He's there. And then all of a sudden on this, the greatest day of his life, the Bible says an angel appears. And it notes it's standing on the right side of the altar. Now, That should fire everybody on up and say, well, why? Because back then the mindset was, if someone's standing on the right side, they're going to give you a blessing. If they're on the left side, it's not good news. So he is on the right side of the altar. He sees this angel, and yet he is terrified by the very presence of the angel itself. And he says to him, on this his greatest day, your prayer been answered. Elizabeth is going to bear a son, and you are to call him John. He says he's never to touch drink because he's to be set aside for the Lord. 
And here's the cool thing, guys. Look at verse 16. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. And then he says, he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now that's an incredibly famous quote from Malachi chapter 4, yep. verses 4 and 5. It is the sign of the kingdom. The sign of the kingdom is that the Elijah who was to come, which would be John the Baptist, would in fact prepare the hearts of the people of God to turn them back to God and therefore unite the children to their fathers and the fathers to their children. Is that awesome or not? You know, uh, the the Lord really has uh, uh, blessed us in a great way here in the congregation. I mean, there have been so many restorations. So many people that have been blessed by God. And, and I just can't help but think about what happened last Sunday. About nine months ago, a couple was restored to the Lord out in Palm Springs. That was Lloydie and Samir Friendsley. And, I mean, they have been so zealous in their serving of the Lord. But in, in the midst of that great joy, I've never seen Lordy any more fired up than last Sunday when she came on in and found out that her mom, who had been studying in the Latin ministry was going to be baptized. And even though Lordy's 30 years old, I mean, she was just literally jumping up and down because she was so excited to be united with her mom in the Lord. Are you with me right here? See, that sign of the kingdom is taking place even to this day. Amen? Let's keep reading right here. Verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? Am I an old man and my wife is along in years? The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you'll be silent, not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. See, right here, Zechariah doubted. Now, on the positive side, Zechariah and his wife were faithful, even though they were heartbroken about not having a child. And there's something to be said about that, to be faithful in the midst of heartbreak. On the other hand, when the angel arrived, and you know something? We never know when our angel is going to arrive, do we? When the angel arrived and says, hey, you're going to have a son. He goes, well, how how can this be? And he says, listen, you're going to be silent because you doubt it. And think about it, that's true. Even to this day, if you do not have faith as a disciple, you are silent. When you have faith, nobody can shut you up. Let's read the end of chapter one. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah, wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. I mean, they were waiting for the blessing. When he came out, he couldn't speak to them. They realized he'd seen a vision in the temple, for he kept on making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. So the time of service was that one-week period, remember? After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he's shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. See, that's really the power of God, is to take away disgrace. You know, today, one of the exciting things is we have a a young lady from uh, UCLA that's getting baptized. Her name's Esther. And, And the thing that's awesome is that every single person, whether it be Esther or perhaps you can even remember back, when you get up and you say, Jesus is Lord before men, And then you go down in the water, and God washes away all your sins. You come up a new creation, and the Lord has taken away your disgrace. You see, this records the account of all the things that led up to the birth of John the Baptist, the herald of salvation. Let's move on. Our second point is, the Lord is salvation. Well, that's literally what the name Jesus means. The Lord 
is salvation. Notice that the beginning of Luke takes place in the city of Jerusalem at the temple. Well, now we drift many, many miles, about 70, 75 miles north to a little town, a little sleepy town called Nazareth. And once more, we find the arrival of an angel. Verse 26. In the sixth month. Well, the sixth month of what? Well, a little bit of pregnancy, right? In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, when the Lord says, Hey, greetings, you're highly favored. You need to buckle in right there, right? Okay. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. What we find in the first part of chapter 1, the scriptural parallel of Elijah to John the Baptist. Now, we find that Luke is putting another parallel. David to Jesus. David is, quote, the Messiah of the Old Testament. Now, very interestingly, many people believe that Mary, at this particular time in her life, was only about 14 or 15 years old. Because that's the time young ladies in that day got married. And they also believe, of which I'm pretty convinced of, is that she was a poor orphan girl. Notice at the end, after all the fanfare of Gabriel, and I have to say this, you know, if Gabriel comes to you, it's always good news. <laughs> if you have a person named Michael come to you, he's another one of the archangels, it's always bad news. So I know all of you guys want to sit a little bit closer to Gabe and a little bit further away from Mike right here. Now, look very carefully at the end of this section of Scripture. We find that Mary has this humble heart. I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Then the next thing we read is, in verse 39, at that time Mary got ready, hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea. No mention's made of her parents. But she goes to a relative that's going to give her shelter and encouragement. Yes, the Holy Spirit's directed her there, but she goes to a relative. I believe that the Lord has picked a poor orphan girl in the sleepy little town of Nazareth to be the mother of God. You know, some say, well, didn't she have doubts? No, 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 you, you don't understand. She simply says in verse 34, how will this be? I mean, she understood basic biology. She goes, I'm supposed to have a kid? I'm not married. I'm a virgin. And the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now, a question comes, well, how, how can this be? I think it's very important that we understand what engagement or betrothal was back in this day amongst the Jews. There were two stages. One is where they agreed to be married. It's the formal witness stage. At this point, the bride's family gives the bridal price. And, believe it or not, at this particular time, they are considered married husband and wife. However, stage two, which happens a year later, is the formal ceremony. At the formal ceremony, there's an incredible celebration, and this is when the groom takes the bride home. So they had a year to think about things. Amen, guys? 
this will become very clear. Now, you know, one of the things that you have to understand right here is the heart of Mary. I mean, she's just been told she's poor. She's most likely an orphan. She doesn't have parents. She's engaged, and she's just been told by the angel, hey, you're going to have a kid. Now, this brings a few complications into your life. Number one, how do you explain this to your fiancé? Number two, how do you explain it to everybody in the village when you start showing? Let's look at another text in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1. I think you'll see this a little bit more clearly and understand even the Jewish tradition a little bit better from this passage. Verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. So they're in first stage, right? But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So, see, in the eyes of law, he was her husband. And to separate meant divorce. Are you with me right here, guys? Verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So right here, I think the two stages of the Jewish, so to speak, tradition about marriage, I think, become quite clear, and perhaps there's no more confusion in your mind. What I think is also important is that Matthew makes it clear that there was no union between Joseph and Mary, even though he took her home, until after she gave birth to Jesus. Because even at this time, there were rumors and traditions that were beginning to form about Mary being a perpetual virgin. Now, she was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus. Amen, guys? And we, either, we have one or two choices to believe. Either she was a virgin or she messed around. That completely changes the issue. Amen, guys? The Bible says she was a virgin. And then the Bible says that Joseph and Mary had a normal marriage after Jesus was born. They had sex and they had kids. That's why Jesus has many half-brothers and half-sisters. Amen? Amen. You know, at the end of the day, though, the complications come clear. Joseph is going, well, I really love Mary, and it's obvious because she's pregnant She's messed around and been unfaithful to me. But then, the arrival of the angel. Like I said, you never know when your angel's about to arrive. Amen, guys? An angel lays it out. Say, hey, it's exactly as Mary said. This is of the Holy Spirit. And you are to take her in and take care of her. And then, you are to give the name Jesus to your first child. You know... I can't help but think back to our brother, uh, Carlos Mejia. Come on, Carlos. Several, several years ago, he was at his sister's house, Ceci's. And you know how Carlos is. Carlos, uh, you know, is friendly to everyone and everything. And all of a sudden, the phone rings at his sister's house, and he just picks it up as if he lives there. You know how that is. Maybe you have a brother or a sister like that. And he answers the phone, and the, the phone call actually is for Ceci. It's a young woman named Cherise Lucas, who had gotten Ceci's name from Kathy Martinez. Kathy Martinez had met Ceci, and she goes, wow, this girl Ceci is incredible. And she lives very close to where you live. you got to call her up and invite her out to church because she's interested. Well, Cherise called. Of course, Carlos is the one that talks on the phone. He talks to Ceci. Ceci doesn't want to talk because she doesn't want to go to church, so later she becomes a Christian, amen, guys. But Carlos is full of joy. He says, yeah, I'll come. He comes to church and loves it. But there were complications in his life. And so he drifted away, even though he knew 
he's seen the Lord. A year later, with his life in the pits, he remembered that day at church. Calls up the people that he met there, attended for two weeks, and was baptized into Jesus Christ. You know, as the years passed, Carlos and Lucy went into the full-time ministry and did a great job for the Lord. And then, as you well know, in our former fellowship, all heck broke loose. They were let go. They were fired. And in the midst of this, they just became embittered towards people and about their lives. And their hearts drifted further and further away from God. Well, speed up time right here. They heard about the new planting here at the City of Angels Church. And Carlos came to our first service. And you know something? She loved it. But there were complications. In about a month, he says, okay, I'll get with you, Kip. So Carlos and I got together. And then Lucy and Elena started coming along with us. Well, just in a couple weeks after that, Carlos says, listen, I want to make Jesus Lord again. And Lucy said, okay, I'll go back to church on Sundays. But I'm not going to every Wednesday, and I'm not going to every Bible talk. There were a few issues, a few feelings, dare you say, a few complications in her life. After another month of studying the Bible and seeing what it really means to follow Jesus, Lucy placed membership and was restored. And the exciting thing is... The exciting thing is, today, they're being reinstated evangelists in the kingdom of God and woman's ministry leader in the kingdom of God. You know, I just got to ask everyone out in the crowd, do you have any complications going on in your life? Is there something stopping you from getting baptized? Is there something stopping you from being restored? Is there something stopping you from placing membership? Because, you know, when you surrender yourself totally to the Lord, like Mary did, there are no complications. The heart is just very, very simple. As Mary said, just very simply, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Let's move on. Our third point is the scope of salvation. Now, this is pretty cool. Let's pick it up again in verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the child you bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Now, this is kind of cool, and I never really picked it up. I don't know what I thought. Maybe I thought that Mary got pregnant at at the time the angel visited. But it's clear in this passage that Mary didn't even know she was pregnant until she went all the way down to her relative's house down there in Judea, about a 70-mile trip. And when she comes on in, Elizabeth greets her. And she's so fired up. Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the child you bear. She says, I know that you're with child, Because the baby inside of me leaped for joy. See, this is the first time John the Baptist introduces Jesus. And of course, Mary then breaks out in song. We find this song recorded in verses 46 through 55. And it's called the Magnificat. Which is Latin for to to magnify, to magnify God. Which comes from the first sentence right here. And let's, let's read the song. And Mary said, My soul glorifies, or better translation, magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. 
From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from the thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servants Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he has said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. You know, in this song right here, Mary is just so happy that she has the Son of God in her womb. And she just spontaneously breaks out in song, praising God. And it comes clear right here in her mind. In verse 48, she says, From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Why? Because of verse 50, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation because Jesus has died for the sins of the world. Both men that lived before he was born, while he was born, and after he was born. That is the scope of salvation. And notice right here, I think it's very interesting. He, she breaks out his song in verse 52. He says, he has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but he's lifted up the humble. God deals with everybody. You know, the other day, I was with uh, Carlos uh, getting with uh, a gentleman that had fallen away from the Lord for a few years. His name's Jake. And uh, we sat down, and Jake had several questions about the new church here and about what was going on. And then he said, Kip, I've just got to tell you some stuff. And he just vomits all of his sins. And then he goes through several things. And then at the end he goes, well, I guess that's about it. <sighs> I'm done. Have you ever been there? I mean, you have all this gunk. And you just have to vomit it on up. And once you confess your sins, I mean, there's just a sense of, okay, I feel better. I feel better. You see, because God humbles the proud, but exalts the humble. Isn't it, isn't it very interesting right here in verse 51? He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. Pride divides. Pride divides. You know, in four days, it's going to be Valentine's Day. And uh, I, was, I was looking on the Internet... And there was this uh, article by this uh, one lady named Jenna Byron. And uh, she says this. If your spouse bugs you now, the future's bleak. New research suggests that couples view one another as even more irritating and more demanding the longer they are together. So I hope you enjoy this Valentine's. Remember, pride divides. And one of the greatest areas of division is divorce. Is divorce. And right here, this lady says, yeah, the longer you're married, the more irritating, the more demanding your spouse becomes. Isn't that amazing? The person that you love the very, very most at one time, you hate their guts. Well, what's the issue? Sin. Pride. Divides. You know, when I think about that, I think about my uh, best friend, Nick Bordierich. And... Uh, Last week, last week, Nick went to uh, Connecticut and was inducted into his college's Hall of Fame for football. You know, Nick was a, a small college All-America in football. And, uh, and yet, really, I know Nick when life was pretty good for him. I met him in Portland. But, you know, there was a time when he and Denise 
were in trouble. I mean, they fell in love when they both worked at Nike. And they had this incredible romance. But as the years went on, and even children came, they each grew more and more irritating and demanding to each other. One of Nick's friends say, listen, you need God. Now, Nick was not religious at all. But he was so humbled by the state of his marriage that when his friend asked him to come to church, he not only came, but dragged Denise there. The service and the preaching and the love was so powerful, Nick just cried through the entire sermon. Now, Denise didn't, but Nick did. Afterwards, they started studying. Why? Because they were on the verge of divorce. But they studied to get their relationship with God right. When they both got their relationship with God right, they understood, hey, if God is going to forgive my sins, then I'm going to have to forgive the sins of my spouse. And yet when you forgive and forget the sins of your spouse, what happens? You're gathered back together. And today we admire Nick and Denise's marriage so much and their family life so much is that Nick and Denise serve as one of our shepherding couples for the congregation. You see, there's no question the scope of salvation can touch anyone and everyone. Well, let's close out our study with our last point, a new day of salvation. At the very end of this passage, we find that at about the nine-month mark, Mary goes home, and Elizabeth is left with her family. And we read in verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and says, no, he is to be called John. You see... Zechariah did communicate. He couldn't speak, but he communicated. You know what I'm talking about right here? They said to her, there's no one amongst your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet. And everyone was astonished when he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was open and his tongue was loose and began to speak, praising God. Now, if you hadn't spoken for nine months, you'd be fired up too, right? <laughs> The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. John means God is gracious. And that's exactly the heart that Zechariah finally had. Interestingly enough, in this next section, Zechariah breaks out in song. And this is called the Benedictus. And it's Latin because it's the first word in the song when this is translated from the Latin text. And what this is all about is simply praise to God. And I suspect if you haven't been able to say anything for nine months, you have a lot to say. And you're very thankful that the Lord finally let you speak again. And you know, it's kind of an interesting psalm. The key part comes right here in verse 68. And it says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of a servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago, Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, and to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, before him all our days. You know, right here, we see this, this tremendous heart of praise of salvation. You know, today we're going to see the baptism of two young men. That's Sean and Brandon. And uh, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, they work for Samir Friendsley out in Palm Springs. And it was kind of cool 
because uh, Vic Sr., Vic Jr.'s dad, uh, counted the cost with these two young men. And in the midst of counting the cost with, with one of them, he says, hey, where were you last Sunday? He says, well, um, Samir wanted me to work because he had to go to church and keep his priorities straight. <laughs> so, you know, Victor challenges to say, hey, you know, uh, you're going to have to keep your priorities straight. You're going to have to lay it on the line right here. And the good news is, when you're baptized, Samir is going to be your brother. The bad news is, he may fire you because you can't work on Sundays anymore. You know, salvation is worth anything we give up. A relationship, job, prestige, money, role. There is nothing compared to salvation. Now look at the end of the song. Verse 76. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. This is talking about John the Baptist. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. Most likely, his parents died when he was young. And when his parents died, he went into the desert and there was discipled by God until the time of the great restoration that occurred. In Israel. What's interesting, though, is that by faith in this song, Zechariah sings, Because of the tender mercy of our God, verse 78, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. Now, (laughs) the idea of the rising sun from heaven, the idea from heaven means it's from God. And the rising sun means the dawning of a whole new day. You know, right now, We are in the midst of a whole new day, the dawn of a new day. You know, one of the things I was so excited about this this past week are all the plans that are being made for our new School of World Missions. Dr. Marty Wooten is going uh, to be the one that's overseeing this, and I'm so excited that young people and old people can come together and really get some in-depth teaching from the Word of God. That's going to be a new day. I'm excited about this summer. This summer, we're going to be sending out two mission teams, one to Honolulu, Hawaii with the Bethamios, and the other to New York City with the Commonsverts. I mean, this is going to be the dawn of a new day. Something that's just touched my heart so much is what's been happening in India. I don't know whether all of you know, but about 16 months ago, we began a new discipling movement in Portland. We believe the Holy Spirit began it. And it's so exciting because we have just been telling people about our convictions about Jesus Christ and what it really means to build his church around the world. We actually believe that we're going to evangelize the world in this generation. The exciting thing is there was a little group in Bombay, or they refer to it over there as Mumbai, that had already separated themselves from a former fellowship. And when they read the internet articles about the start of a new discipling movement, they emailed and say, hey, do you think we could join up? We believe just like you. And of course, anybody can believe the same, just have to have the same Bible, amen, yeah. guys? <laughs> and so we got a church in Mumbai. Well, when a brother in Bangalore, his name was Johnny, heard that this church that separated itself now became part of God's new movement. He emails me. He says, hey, Kip, do you think I could be a part of things? He says, you probably don't remember me, but you probably remember my dad. He was the first elder in our former fellowship in all of India. And he just died a few years ago, heartbroken about what's happening in the churches. He says, but I believe, like you do, that the world can be evangelized in a generation 
I believe in discipling. I believe in calling people to the lordship of Jesus Christ. If I started something here, would you get behind me? I said, absolutely. And then this past Sunday, we got our third church in India in a place called Chennai. This one's equally exciting because there's a, a gentleman named Raja Rajan and his wife, Debbie. Now, Raja's been a Christian for 17 years. For many of those years, he's been full-time. He's tried to reform the church that he was in from the inside, but they just wouldn't change. They wouldn't change of the hypocrisy in the leadership, and they wouldn't change of the lukewarmness in the membership. He began reading the Internet site. He went to visit Mumbai. He talked to Johnny. And he says, I realize the price that I need to pay. He says, I am resigning my full-time job here in Chennai. I'm going to find a secular job, and I'm going to start a new church of sold-out disciples that are now going to be part of the new movement of God. You know, Elena and I need your prayers. Next week, we take off for Guatemala City. And we are praying that God's going to establish two new churches there. One in Guatemala City, in Guatemala, and one in San Salvador, El Salvador. Be praying. I really have faith that's going to happen. But you know what's also exciting? I just got news right before I came. Raul Moreno down in Santiago. And I can't tell you the nation that it's in. But there's a nation in the northern part of South America where the former lead evangelist has contacted Raul And he says, Raul, I now understand why you made your stand in Santiago. I now understand why you gave up a full-time position in the former fellowship in order to become part of the new movement of God. This is what I want to do. Do you want me to move to Santiago and join you, or do you want me to start a new church? And Raul says, it's time to start a new church. I can't share with you the nation. But in that nation, there's going to be a new day. There'll be a new day in every nation. And there could be a new day in your life. Because you see, you never know when your angel is going to arrive. Thank you, and God bless.